Do you know how to use a semicolon? I, I think I do. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. So it may or may not surprise you, but my worst subject in school was always English. I know, it's very STEM major of me, I'm sorry to be a stereotype. But my problem was never with constructing arguments or using imagery, it was literally just writing sentences. If you saw any English paper of mine from high school, you would just see red mark after red mark of misplaced commas, hanging participles, I still don't know what that is, and like, an overzealous approach to ellipses. My problem was punctuation, and there is no piece of punctuation more emblematic of my suffering than the semicolon. The author, Kurt Vonnegut, once wrote that the first rule of creative writing was do not use semicolons. All they do is show you've been to college. Well, I've been to college and I still have no clue. So today, in this video, you and I are going to figure out what's the point of this piece of punctuation. Okay, so first things first, um, I want to figure out if this problem that I'm facing is actually universal or if it's just a me thing. So I'm going to talk to a few friends. <whistles> okay, so it's like been about an hour since I posted my tweet asking for volunteers, asking a question. I didn't use a question mark, <laughs> which is arguably the most clearly labeled piece of punctuation, so maybe this is just a me problem. Nope. Okay, so I just spent the past few days talking to a few friends about punctuation, and I'm feeling vindicated. Vindication! Do you know how to use a semicolon? Like in formal English, I think I do. Next to the interrobang, it's my favorite piece of punctuation in the world. So you start you start a thought, then you're like, wait a second, I want to add a little something more. When you don't really want to finish a sentence, but you need more than a comma. Smush two sentences that are uh, somewhat related to each other together. Separate two distinct thoughts that are somewhat related to each other. And you want to say them at the same time, uh, but you can't because like people think linearly. But they are linked well enough that you want to use a semicolon. So it's used like an and. Oh, also for lists. How certain are you in terms of percentages that you are using a semicolon correctly? 75% confident. Is 75%? 80? 80%? 74%. 50%. I'll give myself a 7 out of 10. Oh, I'm like 105. So you kind of get the sense that everybody's ideas were similar, they overlapped, but they were never identical. In fact, the answers got increasingly vague the further the person got from formal language experience. And I think that's weird. Not that correlation, because that's pretty obvious. It's the fact that there's this symbol that we can all identify, that we're all pretty confident we know how to use, but we're all operating by slightly different sets of rules. It just seems like this inevitable source of miscommunication and confusion, like how does that happen? To answer that, I guess we need to figure out where the semicolon came from? Why'd I say that like a question? Let's figure this out. So I picked up Semicolon, a book by Cecilia Watson, to get a better grasp on the glyph. Watson explores the evolution of grammar and punctuation based on research of a bunch of archived grammar guides. Anyway, it's a great read. It also makes me want to go back in time and fight every single one of my English teachers. But it did teach me something new. So here's the origin of the semicolon. Oh, just in case you didn't know, prior to the rise of common literacy, most writing was done with the intent of being read aloud. Usually in a religious context, that means that originally punctuation was used only insofar as to assist that. Kind of like rests in music. Anyway. Our hero's journey starts around the birth of the Gutenberg printing press. These newfound opportunities in printing inspired the scholars and artists who taught the humanities to get extra creative with the written word. One Italian humanist, Aldus Manutius the Elder, not only invented the first European italic typeface, but also sought a way to signal a pause somewhere between that of a comma and a colon. So, in 1494, he invented the semicolon. It wasn't the first use of this particular symbol, but it was the first to be used with something similar to our modern English intent. Fast forward a few years, literacy was on the rise, and people's stance on the purpose of punctuation began to shift. 
more people than ever before were able to read alone in their head. Was punctuation still supposed to be simple musical rest to break up words? Or did they need rules? Ironically, it was Minutius's grandson, Aldus Minutius the Younger, who, in 1566, said the main object of punctuation was the clarification of syntax. And in doing so, he foreshadowed the next few centuries' confusing quest to codify that very objective. Okay, so the semicolon was born in the 15th century. The general vibe around it was like, yeah, we have a way to mass produce writing. Let's use punctuation to set a beat. This is all so exciting. It's very much the age of like exploration and discovery. However, as literacy continued to rise, so did the demand for standardization. Gone were the days of humanists getting to invent new punctuation. Written language needed to become more standard to facilitate trade and commerce. It needed rules. It needed grammar. So in 1586, William Bullocar devised a set of grammatical rules for English based on a famous Latin grammar textbook. And for the next two centuries, Latin rules became the foundation of proper written English. It made some sense, since many of the people who were reading and writing were also expected to have learned a bit of Latin. However, as literacy continued to rise, written language was introduced to people who couldn't have accessed a Latin education. For these newcomers, the rules were based on a language they didn't know. Fortunately, punctuation lay largely unbothered by these developments. They were still subject to the taste of the writer, dictated by feeling. Then came the 18th century. In what Cecilia Watson describes as an attempt to scientize language, prescriptive grammarians took hold and told school children that just as there are fundamental laws of the universe, there is a definitively correct way to write English. These grammarians climbed over one another, defining increasingly complex guidelines to distinguish themselves from their predecessors. And inevitably, punctuation fell victim. In 1818, the first rule of punctuation came in the form of a hierarchy. The comma was the weakest, the shortest rest, the period the strongest and the longest. But by 1884, there was a long list of rules in place dedicated to punctuation, along with an explicit goal to bind grammar in place. In under a century, punctuation placement had gone from do what sounds right, to dozens of regulations, exclusions, and contradictions. And each update was sold to schools, brimming with false certainty. And with that environment in mind, it's not surprising that people have a tough time, one, knowing punctuation rules, and two, feeling confident in that knowledge. As for the reason why the semicolon seems to get the worst case, um, there's something you should know. Traditionally, you can sort punctuation into two categories, separators and terminators. Terminators, like periods and question marks, have pretty simple rules. I think you know that. Separators, on the other hand, chaos, generally. Like, commas alone went from having 18 rules in the first edition of the Chicago Manual of Style to having 38 rules in the 17th edition. That means not only is there a lot to know about them, but also that those things to know can change drastically between one or two generations. And I think that's whack. So now consider the semicolon. Ooh, another angle change. Anyway, the semicolon, by name and by invention, exists at the intersection of two separate the comma, and the colon. So while those two evolved, so did the perception of the semicolon, while it was also building out its own identity. It was actually only up until pretty recently when we finally settled on some sort of consistency with the semicolon. But regardless, the damage was already done. Students had to bear the brunt of this awful evolution. And that's why the semicolon is so confusing, and to some, so threatening and so scary to use. But. Does it have to be? So I don't know about you, but for me, grammar and punctuation rules are starting to feel like a bit of a house of cards. And yet so many people make it such a massive part of themselves. I know because that was me. I remember obsessively correcting people for mixing up its and its. How dare you mix up things that look almost identical. And judging by the comments on Taha's last video, a lot of you feel the same way. But now consider for a moment that that obsession and loyalty does more harm than good. Remember how I talked to a few friends about semicolons? Well, I also asked them another question. What do you think is the purpose of punctuation? What is the purpose of punctuation? To kind of help communication proceed naturally and in a way that we can process it. Be able to express ideas and thoughts clearly. I feel like it adds tone and meaning. Your tone of voice and how you want to convey your idea. Somewhat how the author intended to say this thing. It is the closest you can get 
to more than just the words. If communication is about exchanging ideas, punctuation is about helping to shape those ideas. Unlike the correct use of a semicolon, everyone converged on the same idea pretty quickly. Tone. It only works insofar as cleaning up the message that is already there, emphasizing its strengths and clarifying its weaknesses. But the specifics for how it does that is subject to evolution. Maybe it's Gen Z's paralyzing fear of conflict to the point of replacing periods with commas and ellipses to avoid sounding too passive aggressive, to overzealous grammarians still trying to chain down this ever-evolving blob we call language. Regardless, it has happened, and it will continue to happen. Disregarding new stages of this evolution in favor of old ones doesn't make you right. It makes you... boring. I'm sorry, that might sound harsh, but these proper rules were forged in privilege. They actively disregard dialects and second language speakers, and, as we've now figured out, they're just as made up as this. And I totally understand that for some of you, this pre-existing standard just feels more clear. And don't get me wrong, I believe that clarity is important when the only form of communication you have is those written words. For example, the law. However, I'm willing to bet that most of your communication isn't creating laws. It's with other people. And you know what's a really easy way to clarify what somebody means instead of scrutinizing their grammar and punctuation? Asking them. To ignore that is to value the punctuation over the person, and that is boring. I'm still just thinking back to these triple commas and all of the beef y'all had in those comments. Sometimes when I'm trying to convey confusion, I purposefully use weird punctuation that will cause somebody to reread the sentence, to question why that stuff is there, to be confused. It might not pass the Chicago Manual of Styles use case, but it does the job. And hey, maybe if we all embrace the fact that language is alive and open to experimentation, the semicolon wouldn't be so scary. And that is on period. Please don't cancel me. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did and you want to support the channel, please stick around because we are thanking Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Sponsors are the only way videos like this are possible. In case you didn't know, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. It's how Melissa Taha and I are running ours. The Answer in Progress website has been hosted on Squarespace long before they sponsored us because I don't have the time to learn how to code well enough to make a site this clean and optimized for mobile. You probably don't either. Luckily, Squarespace is beautiful beautifully designed templates make setup a breeze. The whole thing is pretty intuitive, but there are a bunch of guides, and if that isn't enough, they have award-winning 24-7 customer service. So whether you run a blog, an e-commerce storefront, a fledgling media business with a page dedicated to newsletter subscriber exclusives, or more, Squarespace is perfect for you. Head on over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use offer code ANSWERINPROGRESS to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. But either way, have a lovely day.